One of the responsibilities of the minister is visiting older adults and the sick and those living on their own. At least it was in pre-pandemic times. I've missed this part of my job over the last year because there are so many rewarding aspects to these visits. So many older people have wonderful stories to share, and many of them possess some wisdom for careful listeners of a younger generation to hear and learn from. However, I need to tell you, on occasion I've encountered older adults that were not so pleasant to deal with. Let me tell you about one. Lila was 90 years old, and up until the age of 89, she'd been able to stay in her own apartment. But finally, it became too much for her to maintain, and her son found a place for her in a local home for seniors. It was a modern building with separate rooms for each person, lots of activities, good meals, and even a happy hour. But for some reason, Lila never adapted to the place. She was a very hard person to visit as I listened each time to her long litany of complaints. Her eyesight was going on her and she was too embarrassed to eat in front of other people because she might spill her food. So she demanded that her meals be brought to her room. She couldn't read anymore and she always complained about this. So I arranged for her to have talking books brought to her room. But she said, they're too loud. I I don't like them. Her children and her grandchildren visited her as often as they could. But it was never enough. Now, I know that this sort of constant complaining can be a symptom of a medical problem or increasing dementia or, or a life filled with chronic pain. But I spoke to her doctor. And he said, no, no, none of those things, just a refusal on her part to accept her situation and the infirmities of increasing age. It is interesting to notice the difference between her and so many other older adults with whom I visited. Other people, perhaps years younger than her, with much more restrictive physical challenges, and yet for them, life continued to be more or less a joyful experience. And I couldn't help wondering, what makes the difference? What makes the difference? Why does one person grow old and bitter, yet another person grows old and wise and patient? Is it possible the story of Palm Sunday could shed some light on this issue? Today, of course, is Palm Sunday. Today we celebrate the triumphant ride of Jesus into Jerusalem, where the people hail him as king and lay their garments and palm branches along his path. The writer of Matthew's Gospel quotes an Old Testament passage from Zechariah. Allison read it for us. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. It's a passage talking about a king who will free the people from oppression and establish a rule of great power and justice. I know why Matthew included that passage, but if I can be so bold as to say it, I think he made a mistake. Matthew wrote his gospel to convert the Jews to the Christian faith, so at every opportunity he quotes the Old Testament as proof for the identity of Jesus as the Messiah. By quoting Zechariah, he's saying, Look, look, this entry into Jerusalem by Jesus was prophesied hundreds of years ago. He's the one we've been waiting for. But here's the thing. I can't help feeling Matthew made an error in judgment. Like the people standing along the path of Jesus on Palm Sunday, he was misinterpreting the kingship of Jesus. You see, the people of Jerusalem were looking for a great military leader, 
a king who commanded earthly power and respect, a king who would throw off the yoke of oppression, the oppression of the Romans, and the oppression of their own religious leaders. What they wanted was someone to come in and solve all their problems. And as they saw it, the big problem in their lives was they were controlled and manipulated by other people. They couldn't be happy because circumstances beyond their control robbed them of their happiness. The Romans demanded obedience to certain rules. They levied their taxes. They held the destiny of Israel in their hands. And then to add insult to injury, their own religious leaders humiliated and shamed them, telling them you're unworthy of God. If you're poor, it's because you brought it upon yourself and God doesn't really like you. If you sin, even if it's out of weakness or by accident, God's retribution and punishment against you will be swift and harsh. And so, of course, the ordinary citizen of Jerusalem saw him or herself as powerless, controlled by external forces they could not change or control. They were miserable because in so many areas of life, their freedom had been taken away. I suppose what they believed or what they hoped on that first Palm Sunday was that Jesus would be the man to overturn this situation. He would call down the armies of God to destroy the Romans. He would make Israel a great nation again. He would strip away from the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests their arrogance and flagrant misuse of the name of God. He would reform Judaism, bring it back to its roots, establishing their faith as one that would exalt the poor and the downtrodden and the oppressed. He would give them power and wealth. He would give them freedom and rights. Jesus would make them happy by changing the external circumstances of their life. The people were looking outside of themselves for salvation. They were looking to Jesus in a very human and earthly way to save them. And that's why they crowded along his path and lay down their garments and palm branches for his donkey to step upon. Unfortunately, that is not the message of Jesus. Never has been, never will be. The message of Jesus is this. With God in our heart, no circumstances can destroy us or separate us from the love of God. Our joy is not dependent upon our situation. Even in the midst of hardship and persecution, we can be a triumphant and victorious people. However, that wasn't the message they wanted to hear, so they didn't hear it. They were looking and hoping for another message, a different message. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within. Jesus suggested they could be kings in every place and in every situation, that they were children of God, made in the image of God. They were valuable and loved and cared for by God, even in their poverty and oppression. He taught them that in knowing the truth, joy and happiness and peace were already within their grasp if only they would reach out and take hold of it. The Apostle Paul, who was frequently persecuted, beaten and imprisoned for proclaiming the message of Christ, put it this way, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed every day. So there is a certain ambivalence and confusion in the celebration of Palm Sunday. The people said, he is king on earth. And Jesus said, 
No, I am king of another kingdom, another world, the kingdom of heaven. And if the people had been really listening throughout his ministry, they would have known that already. But like us, they weren't good listeners. So by the time the king of kings is arrested and beaten and brought out before them in the full glory of his dishonor and humiliation, the crowd is more than a little bit disappointed. And perhaps in their anger and disillusionment, they stand before Pontius Pilate and they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. They're frustrated. This pretender to the throne has dashed our hopes and dreams. He has betrayed us. But to the end, Jesus lives out his message. It's a different throne he's after. And so he accepts the undeserved circumstances of his betrayal and arrest and crucifixion. In humility, patience, and trust, he goes to the cross, awaiting the vindication of God. And even as he hangs there to die, he speaks words of encouragement to the man on the cross next to him. And the prayer on his lips is, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. So what makes one person grow old and bitter and another grow old and kindly? Could it be the person's attitude? And as strange as this may sound, I can't help feeling it hinges on the meaning and message on the ambiguity of Palm Sunday. What do we believe we were promised in life? What did we think we would get out of our life? Jesus never promised earthly justice and vindication. He never promised earthly happiness or success. He didn't find those things himself. He only promised ultimate justice, eternal salvation, and joy in the world to come. The Apostle Paul wrote these words in his letter to the Philippians. I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and want. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. So, what is the message of Palm Sunday. I believe it's a triumphant message. In any and all circumstances, we can be kings and masters of our own fate. Like the Christians who have gone before us, wallowing in prison, they sang hymns of joy and praise to God. Facing the jaws of a lion in a Roman arena, they prayed in thankfulness and joy for the assurance of eternal life. Facing the infirmities and challenges of old age, they have passed on their wisdom and patience and faith to their children and grandchildren. Life holds in store for all of us the same sort of experiences, victory and frustration, joy and despair, triumph and tragedy. And in the end, as one old friend often reminds me, this growing old, which she says ain't for sissies. In the end, each and every one of us will have to face the realities of sickness, infirmity, and death. It will not be easy. There will be hard parts. How do we face the hard parts? That's the key. I hope and pray each and every one of us will face them in the assurance of God's love and care and in the sure and certain hope. Christ has defeated even death through the victory of the cross and the miracle of of the empty tomb. Let us pray. 
And now unto God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all praise, honor, and glory, world without end. Amen.